and welcome everyone to Homecoming at Home. We hope that you have enjoyed this week so far. We are in the home stretch of our homecoming activities. Uh, thank you for being with us over this lunch hour uh, here, at least in Pacific Central Time. If you are uh, anywhere else in the world, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kendall Lucas, and it is a privilege to serve as the Director of Alumni Relations here at Point Loma Nazarene University. Uh, today, I am thrilled that my colleagues who are serving on our collective for anti-racism here at PLNU are joining us uh, to share about the beginnings of the work that we are doing um, here at Point Loma. And so uh, with that, I wanna make sure we have as much time as possible to, to hear from our uh, wonderful faculty colleagues and panelists. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you first to our uh, esteemed colleague and a good friend, uh, Kim Barry Jones, who serves as our director for the Center of Justice and Reconciliation and also serves as a member of the collective. So Kim, thank you for being here. Thanks, Kendall. So thrilled to have all of you joining us today. The Collective on Anti-Racism was formed by President Brower last summer in June and is made up of a, a group of staff and faculty across campus who have formed into four working groups. So we're gonna just kick off today with a short video that gives an update from each of the four working groups to give you a little bit more of a handle on what we're focusing on this year as we lean into this uh, lifetime journey of anti-racism. And then the, the real thrill of the event is going to be uh, hearing from our panelists that Dr. Montague Williams will be moderating, moderating for us. So. With that, we will show you this video highlighting the four working groups of the collective. And before we start that, Kimberly, I did forget to mention that if you have questions uh, for our panelists throughout the event today, if you could direct message Kim Barry Jones, she is going to be the one collecting questions that she will then uh, pass on to our moderator and the panel. So again, throughout the event, feel free to pass your questions on to Kim. Enjoy. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Joey Sigawa and I am an alumnus of PLNU and a current faculty member in the Department of Psychology. I've had the pleasure of being a part of the Anti-Racism Collective since this past November and I am currently serving as a member of the working group focused on developing a common language that we can use across the university with regard to our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. In addition, our working group is focused on developing a common set of goals uh, that we can utilize with regard to our anti-racism efforts as well. Since we started, uh, we have developed an initial uh, list of terms uh, that can be used by students, staff, and faculty to enhance our communication and understanding with regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we see this list as a living list that will need to be continually updated as language with regard to these matters is continually evolving over time. Um, as such, we see our work as getting the ball rolling and our hope is that others will step up to keep its momentum moving over time. Um, with regard to common goals, uh, we are currently uh, gathering strategic planning information from both within the university and outside the university uh, so we can determine what uh, common goals we share uh, already uh, with regard to anti-racism and uh, what goals we may want to consider as we look forward into the future. We are also working to develop relationships within the different branches of the university to uh, gain support for any uh, goals that we establish uh, with regard to anti-racism. With that said, we uh, feel that our work is cut out for us as within any system, the accomplishment of these type of goals is challenging, uh, but we are confident that as we join together as students, staff, faculty, and alumni, and gain the support of our administration, that progress can be made. Um, it's been an absolute joy to work with the people uh, within this collective, and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be involved. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully I'll get to see many of you here uh, someday, or if not, uh, here soon. Take care out there. 
Hey there, Loma. My name is Kimmy Leone, and I am so excited to share with you what the Classroom Collective on Anti-Racism has been working on. While we have a few different projects in the works, there are two that I am especially excited about. The first one is our Classroom Course List. We are currently curating a list of courses that specifically deal with issues of racism and anti-racism. This way, when a student has a desire to learn more on specific issues of racism and what they can do to work towards anti-racism, they'll have access to a list of courses that they can enroll in right here at Loma. The next project that I am super excited about is our mini series on anti-racism. Have you ever wondered what a microaggression is? or what they mean when they say systemic or institutional racism? I know I have. That's why we're working on creating a mini series of videos to help define and educate the different forms of racism and how they play out throughout and in our society. The more we're educated on an issue, the bigger impact that we can make. So that's what we're working on. I hope you're as excited about it as I am. And I look forward to seeing you all in the spring. Bye. Thank you for the opportunity to share just a little bit about what the hiring and training group from the collective is working on right now. We know that it's a really important part of this initiative. And so one of the things that we're doing is looking at what are we doing currently in the areas of hiring and training for staff and faculty, but then also discussions about what we can be doing as well and then realistic expectations for how long it would take to implement these things. So in the area of hiring, one of the things we're looking at is uh, training and developing resources for hiring managers and for panels that are interviewing both staff and faculty. How are the uh, questions directed? How are the, is the decision-making being done in ways to mitigate bias, to ask the right questions, the legal questions that we can ask Additionally, we're talking about expanding the interview process to other interested parties from across campus, not just that department, and in trying to evaluate and um, create retention strategies. Because if we and as we hire really good staff and faculty, we want to keep them as well. So in the area of training, I'd say that what we're doing again is looking at what we're already doing. There are a lot of things going on, but I do like what Gallup says about, about diversity training. It often fails when it feels mandated and is not part of a culture built on respect, strengths, and leadership commitment. An effective diversity intervention can't be just a one-day event, and I think our group believes that, and so we're looking at long-range planning for how we are better at listening and how we are better at talking about it, talking about the subject. So we're looking at what training is going on already, whether it's supervisors or for faculty, um, reviewing the current offerings and then uh, making commitments to and talking about having maybe a speaker that comes once a year, but one that everybody hears, students, staff, faculty, and then providing discussion times afterwards for people to be able to talk about what they heard or ask questions. And then finally, offering ongoing book or podcast discussion groups. There's a lot of really good material out there, but we want to offer smaller, more intimate, and more honest settings for people to be having these conversations, opportunities to listen and opportunities to share. And that is where we're at right now. Thanks for letting me have a chance to tell you. Hi, I'm Kim Jones and I serve on the Student Life Working Group. We have been working this year on a process that we're calling bias reporting. What um, became clear to us was that we needed to uh, make some improvements on campus uh, for creating a process for students, but also for faculty and staff to go when they experience an incident. So bias reporting is any intentional or unintentional act or behavior that's directed towards either a person or a group that's based on a facet of that individual's or group's identities. So bias um, incidents could be things like racist slurs, derogatory comments, uh, offensive terminology, cultural misappropriations, and things that are considered microaggressions. So we recognize that we didn't have a clear process at the university for handling that, and we want to make sure that all of our students 
are in an environment where they know that those types of things are taken seriously. And so the bias reporting process is creating not only an actual process for reporting, but also a communications plan so that our students, staff, and faculty know that this process exists and they know that when incidents are reported, they're taken seriously, they're looked into, and then we have a way of then communicating out um, what we do about them. So we, of course, are bound by really important confidentiality rules and want to respect that, but we also see a real need for our community to know that when something happens, that something is done about it. And often those actions are taken behind closed doors because of confidentiality, and then it looks as though um, they're not being taken seriously. And so in order to help change that, we believe this bias reporting process is an important part of that. Uh, there will be a group that is made up of folks across campus that will sit on a team that will be responsible for reviewing these reports. And we also know that it's, it's not just a reporting process, it's actually pushing it into the culture of who we are as a campus. And so we will be doing a lot of work around communicating that across camp our campuses to staff, faculty, and students so that it becomes a part of who we are as LOMA, how we do things and um, increases um, our awareness of these types of events, increases everybody's understanding of how they're responded to and helps all of us work together to lean into this idea of being an anti-racist community. Sorry, I think you might be waiting for me, Kendall. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, sorry about that little bleep. Um, so with that, I am so thrilled to hand this off to Dr. Montague Williams. He is the moderator extraordinaire and um, has been working with this team of amazing panelists to help us try to bring this conversation into such a short amount of time. And we really look at this as, as a first step to hopefully a lot more conversations. But with that, Dr. Williams, I'd like to kick it to you. Sure, thank you. And uh, I just want to take a moment and say that uh, our colleagues did a great job with that video and communicated really well what we are doing and trying to accomplish with the uh, Collective for Anti-Racism here at Point Loma Nazarene University. One of my major goals in this conversation today is that you hear very little from me and quite a bit from the panelists. So uh, we will get started uh, right away. I will ask each panelist, when you give your first response to a question, if you could just briefly let folks know who you are uh, and you know your role on campus, just so there is a bit of an introduction that way. Okay, uh, we want to begin with just some foundational pieces. And one major question people might have is just what aspects of Christian faith move you toward this kind of work, move you towards helping Point Loma become an anti racist university? And uh, Dr. Smith, Taylor, Dr. Valiente, neighbors, if you would take a moment, we could start with Dr. Smith just to speak into that. That would be really helpful. Yes, hi, I'm Dr. Smith. I'm an associate professor in the School of Nursing, and I'm also the uh, faculty fellow for the Center for Justice and Reconciliation. Um, I, my husband is a pastor, so I'm quite involved with the church. And so sometimes our roles kind of, kind of cross because I look at it as, you know, we're both serving people. But the one thing that I found that's very instrumental in me wanting to do this work is the love of Christ. Um, oftentimes, you know, as Christians, we say we love Christ, but we have difficulty truly loving our brothers and sisters, especially those that don't look like us, um, those that may not be as wealthy as we are. And so um, just knowing that Christ has called us to love one another. And it, it's really, you know, if we say we love Christ, then how can we not love our brothers and sisters? Because that is a commandment. And so that's really what has um, really driven me to want to kind of do this work. And to just want to step in and do what I can at Point Loma to help as much as possible in racism. Um, I'm Taylor Pizzuto. I'm a class of 2015 
graduate in uh, writing, um, and I'm a copy editor with Point Loma's marketing and creative services team. Um, and I think our duty as Christians to, uh, to be involved in this work of anti-racism, I think that there's a reason that we've seen the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement all stem from um, this, this following of Christ. And when I think of not just our work for um, anti-racism and compassion, but the harder work of, of true justice and equity um, I think of Jesus upending tables in the temple. I think of um, I think of him calling his followers to sit with hard truths and really um, examine ourselves and, and the roles and, and work we're called to do. Um, all this while the Roman establishment and the state are calling for him to be less divisive. Um, but I think that the difficulty of that work, I think, is all worth it in the end because um, exactly what, what Jesus and the Bible tell us the world reward we're working toward and that's bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. Hi everyone, my name is um, Jamalise Valiente Neighbors. I echo my colleagues um, statements. For myself, I think about it in the life of Jesus, his focus on justice, his focus on welcoming the stranger and loving our neighbors. The two verses that really stand out to me are Micah 6, 8, or an excerpt of it that says, and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? And then Isaiah 58, which, you know, is really long. You could read it. Um, but verses 6 to 7 says, is, is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free? And to break every yoke, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. And to me, as Christians, we're called to act. We're called to not hide. And that's why just saying I'm not racist that seems just very passive, right? And that's why for me, it's about being anti-racist. It's about being curious. It's about asking questions. It's about being proactive. And that's why those two verses really um, call me to act and to be proactive and to be anti-racist. So thank you for letting me share that. Thank you. That is, um, those are some very deep reflections for us to that speaks deeply into the mission of Point Loma Nazarene University. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Smith, I know that you work closely with seeking change within the student makeup of the nursing programs. I know that is, that is at uh, the core of some of your concerns in this work. And I know that you come to this work with uh, certain experiences that have shaped your, your move towards anti-racism. Would you be willing to share a bit about your own experiences that have moved you in this direction? Uh, sure, sure. Um, I grew up in the South in North Carolina and I can remember experiences when I was a little girl where I, I would be with friends that you know were Caucasian and they were referred to as girls and I was referred to as a gal. And it wasn't said in a nice way and I thought, well, what's so different about me? You know, we are the same, essentially. One skin is lighter, another one is darker. But um, so that is not a very endearing term to me because it was not said in a nice way to me. And another experience that has really moved me, um, I remember in the fifth grade, we were given an assignment to um, trace our ancestors and um, to speak to their ethnicity. So my mother is approximately 40% Caucasian and I did my DNA test, I'm 25% European. So when I traced my ancestors and I identified my great great grandparents as being Caucasians, I was told if I ever said that again, I would fail, I would um, get a failing grade and I would be sent to the principal's office. And I thought, but you asked me to, you know, to do this assignment, I'm speaking the truth. So what is it that you not like about it? Um, I had a very similar experience when I was working at Sharp. One of the patients, um, visitors asked me, what are you? And I was like, well, that's strange. 
And I was like, you mean, what is my ethnicity? And she was like, yeah, what are you? And I said, well, um, part Caucasian, but primarily African-American. Well, you don't look like that. Well, <laughs> well what does that mean? You know, so it's just this, why, um, why do I have to deny my ancestors? Because my skin is not as light as yours, but they're still my ancestors. You know, you can't get Italian, Scandinavian, um, Greek from Africa. It has to come from those countries. And so it's just really, you know, been a, been a part of me wanting to just understand and help other people understand that, you know, I may not look like you, but I'm still a part of you. And ultimately, we are all a part of God's kingdom. We're all his children. So it doesn't matter what my skin color looks like. We're all his. So thank you. Dr. Smith, what I hear in that is recognizing the complexity of race and the complexity that young people face just seeking identity formation uh, in the midst of the broad community that makes up our lives. I know that uh, Jill Hamilton Bunch, Dr. Hamilton Bunch, she said I can call her Jill, so I might do that throughout this conversation, everyone. Uh, but uh, she's worked in the public school system and even shared with me that she's she's had a bit of a glimpse of what it's like to be in, in an anti-racist environment, at least one that's really moving in that direction. Could you speak into that? Sure, so I am Jill Hamilton Bunch and I'm a graduate of Point Loma in 1990 and I'm the Associate Dean for the School of Ed, but I'm also the Director of the Bakersfield Center. So I'm in Bakersfield and I taught in Delano, which is the home of the farm workers movement. So um, it's about 32 miles north of Bakersfield and uh, just a really wonderful community and just a, such a great district. And just my heart will always be there, even though I'm not teaching every day in the district, it's still my district. And um, it was just, uh, I think one of the most important things for having conversations about race are to make sure that you are having conversations with everyone who has experienced racism. So we had a very plural teaching staff. Our student body was very plural. Our leadership was very plural and continues to be in the district. And um, it was very honest. It was very forthright. Um, so sometimes it was awkward and we were okay with it being awkward and because we knew if we were gonna move um, positively, not just in our own community, but outside of our community, um, we had to be comfortable with being uncomfortable sometimes. And I think in any healthy conversation um, regarding race, we have to have conversations that are a bit awkward and we have to be willing to do that. Um, so I, I just see that as absolutely the model of, of where, what we should be doing in our daily lives, in our communities, in every um, aspect of, of any corporate setting, um, we need to include those things. That, that sense of discomfort and awkwardness, being faced with realities across lines of difference, it reminds me a bit of Taylor's experience uh, after Michael Brown was killed and you were a student at Point Loma. And it, I know that it created a moment for you of being moved in the direction towards anti-racism. Could you share with us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so you hit the nail on the head. I'm, I'm white, straight, cisgendered male from a comfortable socioeconomic background. Um, so I just, I have a ton of privilege to unpack um, and be responsible for. And so, yeah, in 2014, after the shooting of Michael Brown and the protesting in Ferguson, um, there was an event that was held on campus in the ARC put on by uh, Mosaic groups, um, different departments, different faculty and staff. Um, I think the CJR, from what I believe, too. Um, and yeah, it was just an opportunity for to get students to come together and speak, listen to each other, to mourn, and yeah, just collect as a university community. Um, and I just remember throughout my whole, um, my whole time at Point Loma, I think I was beginning to learn how much I needed to unlearn and how much I still have to do. Um, and that kind of started that on that on that journey. But yeah, after that, um, that uh, 
event in in the arc that really got me to hear a lot of different perspectives that I didn't hear before in um, in my own life and upbringing growing up. Um, and yeah, part of the the reason that I came back to Point Loma to, to work here was not just the things that I I enjoyed and wanted to share with others, but also the things that I um, saw that could continue to to use work and the things that could be um, improved and more unlearning that could be done here within our own community. Um, and so, yeah, I think just knowing that the potential for what what Point Loma could be and, and wanting to achieve that, I think, is exactly like like I said, why I wanted to come back and work here. That um, thank you, Taylor. Um, I know that the different experiences uh, as a student can shape the way you view the school, the way you encounter Christian faith and what it means in this place. And I know that the current university chaplain has, uh, has entered his work here with the, with the previous experience of being a student. Uh, Reverend Trujillo, uh, would you be willing to just share a bit about that? Could you tell us a bit about how you've seen Point Loma shift over over the years, uh, but could you also just give us a sense of your student experience? Yeah, sure. My name is Esteban Trujillo, and uh, I graduated in 2003, and uh, certainly um, as a former student, you know, I could think back to my first semester um, being very difficult, you know, really trying to navigate, um, you know, a majority white space, um, and then also experiencing uh, microaggressions such as, you know, like your English is amazing or, you know, assumptions that I was on the soccer team, uh, which I'm horrible at soccer, but, you know, because of who I was, there's this sense of like, oh, there's a reason why you should be here at this place. There's a reason why, and people are trying to figure that out because I stood out as someone who was different than everyone else. And so, but, you know, as I continued, you know, I did feel like I was embraced more by the community, but then I understood also that I had to navigate a different space. You know, there was no, uh, there hardly any representation of uh, people of color within leadership. You know, invited guests, you know, weren't normally people of color, you know, people in chapel, people who were brought in for lectures or things of that nature. Um, you know, sometimes even feeling tokenized, to be honest. You know, I was a worship leader on campus. I was part of spiritual development as a student, you know, and so uh, being put on the platform to lead a couple songs in Spanish on a preview day, you know, because there's also going to be a Black speaker that day as well. So it, it, it's, it's all of these kind of places, you know, being, you know, walking down Kathleen and being pulled in for a marketing photo, you know, all of those different things were part of my experience. Um, but then also seeing the inequities on campus, you know, such as, you know, Mosaic, you know, I was in Alas, we didn't have a place to meet, we just said, we're going to meet in front of the calf to meet somewhere else and find an open space somewhere, you know, um, uh, I was part of summer ministry team, and, um, you know, uh, I was a bilingual ministry team, and so we had, we compared, you know, even equipment and transportation you know, we had a van with a trailer hitch while the other team that was all Caucasian had a bus that was redesigned with bunk beds and, you know, uh, card tables so they could play, you know, mini bus that they get, got to travel in, uh, wireless equipment, all of those things. So there was a sense too, um, whether directly or indirectly, of feeling second class, of feeling like the JV team, you know, when it came to things like that, when you were trying to represent the school as a person of color, trying to recruit other students uh, as a person of color. And so now as a, as a staff member, as a chaplain of color, being actually the first chaplain of color that we've had in this institution, you know, I, I feel like there's a need for me to respond to places of individual and systemic racism on campus. You know, um, I have been privileged to, to hold the stories of many students of color on campus who've come to me because they feel open to share about their experiences. And so I, I hold that with great responsibility, but also with great care. There is something about the position that I'm in that uh, enables me to do something about this, to do something not only about the experiences I've, I, I've been part of, but also the experiences that students continue to have. And so it helps me to reflect both uh, still the great progress that need to happen. And then also at the same time, like we, we need to be people who continue to have good representation. You know, when students think of a chaplain, I want them to think beyond the white male preacher, you know, 
Um, and so it's good for students of color to see people of color in those places. It's also good for white students to see and reimagine and shape what a pastoral voice and a pastoral leadership voice looks like. Uh, the one who proclaims, you know, God's message, God, the good news to, to God's people. So these are the ways in which uh, I, as a chaplain and a person who's entering into a, a, white, a place that was mainly for, uh, you know, a white space, uh, to really make, make that change and, and enter into, uh, into the good work that we are called to do um, in this anti-racist collect collective. Wow, thank you. Uh, Chaplain Trujillo, that is, um, that is just so insightful. It sounds like, like this experience is not something that you just hold on to as a moment, but it has worked your way into your hope for the institution, your hope for Point Loma, and more specifically, the hope for, for our students. I, I really appreciate that. Um, Dr. Valiente Neighbors, you're, you bring an expertise into this conversation around race. Uh, many, many have experiences and have an interest and have a way into it through their different fields, but, but you go directly into this, you teach uh, one of the main courses on the campus that deals with race and ethnicity. And just from your, from your observation, from that expertise that you bring, what do you see as our biggest challenges as we look forward? I think you're still mute. You're, you're, uh, My yeah. mic is now on. <laughs> I think what I've seen and observed among the students and perhaps, you know, former students at Point Loma is that there is a lack of understanding of racism at the macro levels, right? It just seems to be defined as just malicious individual or small group actions. And so when I talk about it in my classes, um, some students, you know, respond with, but I didn't do anything like, but I'm not, but I didn't do that. Or I, you know, they just seem to just personalize it. And so that I know is a big challenge. Again, like just the lack of understanding of the larger pictures and also implicit biases. Like we all have implicit, implicit biases. And, you know, um, Kim said earlier in the video about the bias reporting, it's like, we do have a lot of hard work to do to, you know, de-bias, right, to de-bias ourselves. And again, it's just that we are, you know, we can be really good people, we can be really kind and compassionate people, but without that understanding of how racism works and how it's so integrated and even like foundational that, you know, if we look at racism as at the roots and then it's impacted everything else in society, at the stem or at the, the blossom or at the fruit, then we really um, have to do that hard work. So, yeah. Thank you. And I know Jill that you, you bring a similar sort of concern with a specific attention to the work of teaching and especially bringing your expertise in education uh, and being in a different context. Could you speak into this as well? Yeah, so I, I love uh, that analogy of the root and the tree and the fruit. Um, the system is, it's not just that the system doesn't work, it's that the, that the system is designed not to. So I think that that idea of, of, of inculcating and in teaching our teachers who are going to be in, you know, with children and with adolescents and young adults, um, that the system itself is, is an issue, is critical. Um, otherwise, there's a, there's a I'm a good person kind of uh, um, feel, as you said, um, instead of uh, understanding that the system itself needs to change. And um, that's important for us in the School of Education in, in preparing our teacher candidates. But that's also important that when our teacher candidates are in fact in the field, that they're passing that, they're, they're um, teaching that same understanding to their students because that's the key as we, as we are teaching, we've got to teach our kids writ large 
that it's the system itself that's the issue because it, the system perpetuates itself. So um, I think that's really the, the critical work of, of larger change is understanding that it's not just course correction or um, it's not just you know these small things which are good, but it really is desystemizing and and changing the system itself, which is designed improperly. And I, I think that's that's a move that you have to make to um, as an educator. I, I will speak from my purview. Um, you have to make that move in order to really um, in to really change. Uh, you know, not to change. Uh, it's it's odd to say to change the world, but if we're really going to make systemic change, we have to question the system itself, and that is a heavy lift um, for some of our kids who are coming into teaching from a, a very um, privileged place. And I think that that's really important. Um, what I'm excited about is um, how how that can really make a difference once they're out in, out in the field. Thank you. Dr. Carr, you are the Chief Diversity Officer for, the, for Point Loma Nazarene University, and you've been uh, holding Point Loma's hand for years, uh, walking them forward, walking us forward, seeing the institution take steps forward and seeing the institution find places of being afraid of the steps that they need to take, maybe even repeating certain cycles along the way. Uh, if anyone is aware of the biggest challenges Point Loma faces, it would be someone who has seen the way Point Loma has uh, addressed things along the way. Uh, would you be willing to speak into this? What, what are the biggest challenges you see? Thank you, Dr. Williams. I, uh, first of all, uh, you've already partially introduced me. I am Jeffrey Carr. I am the Associate Vice President for Student Development as well as the Chief Diversity Officer. I've been here at Point Loma for about 14 years and uh, I have uh, seen quite a bit in those 14 years. And I'm really happy. I want to say this, uh, Kendall kind of said this, but I want to say it again. I want to say thank you to all the alumni who have chosen to uh, uh, join us today. It's a, quite a few of you here. I actually recognize uh, a few of you who were here during the time, the 14 years that I've been there. So thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for uh, wanting to, uh, to sacrifice part of your time uh, to learn more about what your alma mater is doing and how you in some way could also uh, help in this quest that we have. Um, uh, having said that, uh, Point Loma is a wonderful place and all of you know that it's a wonderful place. Uh, but Point Loma in our bubble that we are, and we, the Point Loma bubble is, is, is uh, ferociously famous that we have a bubble, but we do not exist in a vacuum. We're part of a larger society and I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is that we're in a society that is deeply, deeply divided right now. It's something that's been leading to over the years and it really hit an apex uh, earlier this year uh, with the, um, the riot at the Capitol on January the 6th. It really exposed that we're a deeply divided society, one in which we are challenging actual uh, experiences and histories that we've had as if they never happened. Uh, we talk about an anti-racism collective, but when you have a huge amount, I mean, 30 to 50% of this country who says that racism is not a real thing, that it doesn't exist. As uh, Dr. Valiente never says, one of the uh, things that she has, that she has to deal with, when students come to the class, they want to in internalize and say, well, I'm not a racist. They don't understand what racism is. And when you think there is no problem, you cannot address that problem. That's always gonna be a challenge. And I would like to take that a little bit further because we are a Christian university. And as a Christian university, uh, and Dr. Smith said it so eloquently, we need to love one, one another as much as we love Christ. He commanded us to do that. And when you see the, the insurrection that happened at the Capitol, with folks carrying around uh, signs and uh, advancing on the capital that said, Jesus saves, it creates a real divide within the Christian faith. 
where we have a group who are saying they want to take things in their own hands instead of leaning into Jesus and allowing him to work the work that needs to be worked within us. Those are some of the challenges that we have to recognize. We have to recognize the historical significance of who we are as a people and not just live in the moment where things are so divided. And that has been my hope that even as these things happen across the country that tend to also impact us on our campus and all of our alumni who are on your, maybe no longer a part of our campus, you are dealing with it up front and forward every day, those kind of divisions that are there. It is a real challenge. It is something that even recently I've dealt with. I'm the person that receives all the complaints that comes into the university. And I've received complaints from folks who are feeling as if they're being ostracized or discriminated against uh, because they have differing views about who they are as evangelical Christians. So we definitely uh, see that as a challenge. And if we recognize that challenge, and if we're able to uh, try to understand it, we can make advances towards overcoming that. But I definitely see that as something that we as a, a group, as a campus, we need to recognize and we need to be cognizant of so that we can take this work forward. Uh, because if you believe there's no such thing as racism, then certainly the idea of anti-racism makes no sense. So our anti-racism work is really based on a firm knowledge of who we are and we live in a world of reality, not one of fantasy. So I just wanted to say that we, we can actually do better and we will do better if we continue to do the work that we're doing right now. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Yes, I, uh, I, I really appreciate that focus. I mean, the, bring that down to that, that simple focus. If there is such thing as racism, then the work of anti-racism should not be controversial for us as Christians. It should be where we move. It should be our commitment. And I thank you for that reminder. Uh, Reverend uh, Trujillo, I, uh, I know that you, along with Dr. Carr, have a wide view of the university. Uh, what do you see as our biggest challenges as we move forward? Well, not to be too chaplain-y, but we are in the season of Lent here. And uh, this season of Lent is a season of truth-telling, of being honest of who we are, of being honest of, of our world and our community. And so we are in an appropriate time and space to, to really kind of uh, speak truth. And so uh, I'm going to dive into it with that, with that notion of, of truth telling, um, because I feel like as, um, you know, I feel like as we think about the diversity and the percentage of our staff and faculty, I think many times we, we, we feel encouraged that diversity numbers are growing, are growing. But if we take a closer look at places of power, and voices of power and who has um, places at, um, at the table for decision, uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, and, and that includes, um, you know, places of, that have been mostly white dominated. So, you know, we can think about places um, and, and positions that have been maybe designated or definitely imagined to have people of color. So we think about the CDO, we think about multicultural and international student services. We think about international ministries. We think about CJR and all of these particular places where we, we imagine already that people of color are the right candidates for these places. But what I'd like for us to do is have a, uh, is the, the challenge is having a wider imagination. I would say a holy imagination, um, a kingdom imagination of what it means for places like cabinet places like our faculty and our deans and our provosts and our, uh, you know, all of these places, the chaplain, you know, all of these particular places to have this God lens to imagine and see uh, uh, a more diversified and, and, and a wider imagination and seeing people of color being in those places too. Um, I think that's the challenge where we're at, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Uh, Valente Neighbors uh, talked about, you know, the root, you know, this is the foundation, you know, these people, these places, this is the foundation of how we then move and the direction of our university. And so um, we need to challenge that. We need to challenge the ways in which uh, that is there. And so as we look at, you know, new vacancies and new hires in the future, um, um, and we wanna be committed to being an institution that's anti-racist, 
um, having people who are committed to those things and who have experienced it um, would be great people to fill in in those places and lead us into a uh, a better, more kingdom-minded um, um, way of, of living out who we are as PLN. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Valiente Neighbors, Dr. Smith, Dr. Carr, would each of you take a moment just to share uh, something you see in this work that's giving you hope? There you go. <laughs> I can go first. Um, for me, what gives me hope is when I see young people asking questions. I see young people reading and learning and teaching each other um, and also making their voices known and heard. Um, I think, for example, the Mosaic students um, over the summer, we had a, the collective had a phone call on Zoom with Mosaic students and they articulated things that are hard even for just the collective to like, oh yeah, that. And so I really am hopeful um, because our students are, like I said, asking questions and are really um, energetic for this. And so I do hope that that energy, um, you know, is like the grassroots, right? It just um, energizes all of us, um, even though we may not consider ourselves young people anymore <laughs> so for all of us. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for me, um, a couple things. Um, since I've been at Point Loma, this is my fifth year, I think. Um, but we have new committees formed to do the work around racism. That's encouraging. Um, when I first came to Point Loma, actually, um, a, members of my organization, the San Diego Black Nurses Association, they were in awe when I said, you know, I work at Point Loma. It's like, what? You, you got a job there? And I was like, yeah. And so, you know, it, it's like um, 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 Chaplain Trujillo was saying, you know, we need to see people of color in these positions. And that's sort of strange in the community to have a Black faculty in the School of Nursing. And so since I've been there to see these committees form to do the work of racism, uh, I was very encouraged um, when I was accepted as a faculty for the Center of, um, for uh, Justice and Reconciliation. Um, my interest is in bringing more minority students, students of color into the nursing program. Um, you know, I, I teach 60, 70 students per year and there may be two Hispanics, you know, four Filipinos, maybe one African-American if I see that, you know, and it's not like nursing is not a field for, for these students. It's not that they can't thrive, but are we welcoming those students? And so it's my, my desire to bring more students of color in. But I'm also encouraged, um, it was kind of surprising to me that some of the nursing students were marching with Black Lives Matter. So, you know, just to see that these students do know and understand that this is the population of people you will be serving. And so you do need to come alongside and um, be advocates for them. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I um, am very hopeful that this renewed interest in who we are as a people uh, is something that has allowed us to be more open now than we've ever been in terms of dealing with these uh, entrenched ideas about uh, race and, uh, and the ideas that we have about who we are as a people. I'm very sad that it was due to the, um, the murder of George Floyd last summer. I'm very sad that it has taken those kinds of things for us to uh, finally stand up and say that we need to do something different than we've done. Um, it has been that type of of lack of recognizing that has allowed those things to continue to happen. I was actually on a podcast the other day and in that podcast, I mentioned someone, one of the greatest uh, uh, um, things that have helped us in terms of social justice and help us understand who we are as a people is the invention of the iPhone in 2007. 
because without the iPhone, many of us would still be in this sense of being lulled into this is a society that's just fine, that there's no inequity and that we are uh, okay as a people. But the numerous, I mean, numerous hundreds of, um, of video presentations, they say something very different. And so that has caused us to be more open and just more realistic about who we are. And that has actually uh, been something that's impacted our campus as well, as people begin to think more deeply about uh, what responsibilities that we have and how we can move things forward within our uh, uh, environment and in hopes that it would impact the large environment. I specifically chose the background that you see here in uh, my video of the Center for Intercultural Development. It's something very new. We just opened it up in the uh, fall of 2019. And many of you who are alumni, this was not uh, at Point Loma when you were there on campus, if you matriculated on the uh, Point Loma campus. Uh, but the openness of having a spot that's dedicated for students to assemble um, uh, Esteban, our uh, revered, the right Reverend Esteban Trujillo, said when he was a student, they had to meet out on the calf lane because there was no place for them to go. I was so happy that he was there to actually bless this space when we opened it this past, uh, when fall of 2019. And many of you were there and I really appreciate your support. But things like this gives me hope. They're small incremental things. And as you can see on the wall behind me, there are uh, actual, um, the logos for some of the uh, cultural interest clubs on our campus. They have um, meeting spaces, they have office spaces for the, uh, all the clubs, and just an opportunity for us to have a place of residence on campus that says that you are wanted and you have a place here. That gives me hope. Um, but that hope is one that's not the same as it should be for folks to give up and to stop. It's only for us to continue to move forward that sense of being lulled into everything's okay, okay in our society or everything has been done on our campus will be our greatest threat. Our greatest hope can be our greatest threat if we're not careful. We have to understand that this, even this uh, uh, Center for Intercultural Development is just one of many steps. The work that we do in the Collective for Anti-Racism is an ongoing work, it's not just with this a group who have been talking for the past seven months is for us to find ways to internalize it in everything we do on campus. What we do in our classrooms, what we do in our uh, communications with one another, what we do as we represent the campus off campus. When you're in the midst of others in your churches and other organizations, that is what we have to do. So thank you, uh, you know, so much for allowing me to say this, but we still have a long way to go in all of that hope. Thank you. Um, and that is important. You have to hold hope and honesty together. You can't replace honesty with hope. And um, that's, that's, um, thank you. I want to just let everyone know, you know, we've seen a few questions come in. And I think along the way, a lot of those questions have been answered. Uh, if you came in late, you probably didn't see that opening video, which answers some other questions that weren't discussed here because the opening video addressed them. That video, I believe, will be made available on pointloma.edu slash diversity. So will some updates on what's happening in the collective. And that, that website at one point existed with a broad focus on diversity and uh, it went away and it's back with a focus on anti-racism and it will over time return to a broad focus on diversity and a much larger scale of what's happening here at Point Loma. Uh, let me just close us out. We have three minutes, so we can't have everybody share on this. Let me, or we just can't have everyone share for very long, okay? Let me just invite Dr. Smith. Let me invite Taylor. Let me invite Jill. Uh, Taylor and Jill are both alum. Um, so Dr. Smith, Taylor, and Jill, if you could just give some quick explanations of how folks can uh, get involved as alum. Yes, um, I think it, it would be great if the alumni could um, really speak to our students and, you know, let them know what's going on in their workspaces, their workplaces, how, you know, diversity is changing, how racism and, 
um, anti-racism is being worked in their um, perspective or, or potential places of employment. Because, you know, as you know, some of them will be following you. They will be working in spaces where you are working alongside with you. So, you know, if you could just lend a voice to let them know that this is what's being, do being done. Uh, so they don't come in blindly and, and they come in knowing that, you know, certain things will be tolerated and certain things will not be tolerated. And not to say that our students are racist, but just so they know, you know, in this workspace, this is what we believe in and this is the work that we're doing to end racism. So, yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Taylor, do you have any insights in a way that alum can be involved? Yeah, I mean, from my position in marketing and creative services and some of the channels that um, Point Loma hosts publicly and, and through Viewpoint Magazine on the internet, um, honestly, one of the best ways that I've seen that alumni have been engaged and can continue to be engaged is calling us out, keeping us in check, um, letting us know when we get stuff wrong. Um, the work of anti-racism is hard and ongoing. Um, at the same time, that's not an excuse that that responsibility ultimately falls on Point Loma to continue working to get better. Um, and as uh, Dr. Carr mentioned right now, what we see from the way people interact is very divisive, but I think Point Loma is able to operate in this really uni unique space um, of people that think maybe Point Loma is moving too fast, others that think Point Loma is moving too slow. Um, but I think that's one of the, the great things about, um, about higher education in a Christian liberal, liberal arts institution like Point Loma is that we get to hold this really unique environment to come together and um, yeah, just challenge one another. And so, I mean, the, loosely quoting um, one of my favorite quotes from, from James Baldwin, uh, he says, I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. Um, and I think that that is part of the work, both of loving Point Loma as an institution, but also knowing how it can continue to get better. Um, but yeah, I think just continue to, to stay engaged and um, be actively involved in participating. Thank you. Jill, would you like to close us out? Sure, I'll close this out with um, yes, 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 and yes. Um, participate in your community, participate in this community, hold us accountable. Um, and I think about what we teach our teacher candidates, which is know when to nurture and know when to push. And um, in our district, we used to say nurture, push, 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 um, because there's a lot of change that needs to happen. And so I, I would definitely say thank you for nurturing, but definitely know, know when to push and hold us accountable for pushing um, as well. So um, that, would, that would be my, my final, um, just my final thought on, you know, just the importance of who we are as alums of this, of this space, but also who we need to be in our community um, in, in really uh, demanding um, change. I wanna thank all of the panelists for participating in this conversation. Uh, I hope that everyone who's tuned in, I hope that you have a sense of this dynamic work that's happening on campus. And that it's the kind of work that isn't just uh, doing some sort of uh, pie in the sky kind of view of Point Loma, but a real honest and hopeful kind of work. We'll be sending a survey out to everyone after this session for continued feedback and questions in addition, please go to uh, pointloma.edu slash diversity for updates on the collective. Thank you to everyone. God bless. Can we thank our panelists? For those of you who have video on, if we can just give a round of applause. Thank you to each of you. Uh, thank you, Montague. We appreciate your uh, moderation of this conversation. And again, we want to remind you that this recording will be made available on our website, pointloma.edu slash homecoming in the coming days. And we invite you to continue to participate throughout the weekend in homecoming. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you to each of our panelists. We are so grateful for the work that you are doing. Uh, we pray blessings over your work um, as you move mountains on behalf of Point Loma Nazarene University to make us a better place. God bless each of you. Thanks for joining us today.